This is Personal Injury Court. Good day, everyone. This is the matter of Orlando versus Martin. Mr. Orlando, it's my understanding that you are suing Miss Martin for severe injuries that you received while a passenger on her boat. You're asking this court to award you past medical expenses of $75,000, future medical expenses of $20,000, pain and suffering of $300,000 for a total award of $395,000. Is that correct? Yes, yes Your Honor. Honor. Okay, Miss Martin, you believe that had Mr. Orlando followed the safety rules that you gave him, he never would have been injured and you all wouldn't be here in court today. True? Yes, Your Honor. Well, let's get into the legal sauce. What led you up to the boat ride? Well, Your Honor, me and Mark have been together for 10 years. We've been married for five. We met in college, so it's like your standard love story. Um, we were also fortunate enough to actually meet five really good friends in college as well. Every year, we go on a trip together to kind of recharge. So this is a big deal. Yeah, it's a big... Okay. Every year, we turn up. So we decided to go fishing. I looked online, and I found the Lorelei, which um, Nancy is the captain of. So we hired her to charter our boat to go fishing. That's right up my alley, the right. fishing. I've been fishing since I was four years old. I will fish in a ditch. Good. <laughs> great stuff. Miss <laughs> Martin, tell me about your boat. It's called the Lorelei. It's um, a 58-foot boat. Um, it has two Cummins 450 horsepower engines, diesel engines on it. It's pretty fast. How'd you come to know about boats and, and operating boats? Actually, um, Your Honor, I was in the Navy for 22 years. Mm, I, thank you for your service. Thank you. I, um, I obtained the rank of an 06, which is a senior officer, a captain. My dad taught me to fish like you. When I was four years old, I was out fishing with him all the time. It's my passion. So I knew, like five years before retirement, that I was going to come home and open up a charter fishing business. Tell me about your fishing boat business. What do you do? Um, I take people out on charters. Um, we have a manifest list um, who lists all that's of our That's the real passengers. deal there. There you go. That's it. And that's what you do? You go out and troll for the big fish? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I okay. know where all the sweet spots are. So tell me what happened. So we were winding down. I was actually in a really, really great mood because I had just big, it caught the biggest fish. So I was actually really excited. I had a bunch of adrenaline. Uh, we were getting ready to dock. My buddy Carlos was actually on the dock because he stayed back. He was a little bit hungover from the night before. Cause, uh, yeah, fishing and drinking are like kissing cousins. Yeah, she screamed out, welcome home. I assumed that that was what we were, that was, at that point we were done. We stopped, I was only, there was only like an 18 inch gap. And I'm pretty athletic, I figured I could clear that, no problem. As I get ready to jump, she violently throws the boat in reverse, causing okay. me to lose my footing. At that point, I smashed into the pylon on the dock, and at that point, I was underwater. I was afraid for my life because I felt weak. I could feel the, the, the air leaving my body. And the crazy thing was, she actually continued to put the boat in reverse. It wasn't until, you know, she heard the screams of my wife screaming, the other patrons on the boat were actually distraught, that I actually, you know, I had to to pull myself out of the water in pain. Now, Mr. Orlando, you submitted to this court an animation. I want you to go to the plasma screen and take me through this so I know exactly how this happened. Okay, this is how the, the dock is configured that day? Correct. All right, um, now take me through this. So basically, this is the dock and this, my buddy Carlos was about in this area. I'm sorry, Judge. And this is the pylon that I hit right here. Okay. Um, so as she was pulling in, um, like I said, we were all winding down, getting ready to, to get off the boat. She yelled, welcome home at this point, to which I jumped. And then she violently threw the boat in reverse. At this point, that's when I hit the pylon. So what happened first, the jump or the boat going in reverse? It was kind of simultaneous because the moment I got ready to jump, that's the reason why I smacked into this pylon because I lost my footing. Mr. Orlando, you can return to the boat. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ms. Martin, do you remember this day? Uh, yes, sir. What happened out there? I did have to come around those two boats and put it into that slip, which I was trying to do. Um, Had I you did... done that before, put your boat in that slip? Oh, sir, many, many, many times. I was um, backing up the boat, and um, 
I heard one of my crew members yell, man overboard. I faced the bow of the boat, so I knew that no one fell off the front, and so I did not see what happened. So immediately, I turned off my engines. I turned it over to my first mate. I ran down the steps, ran to the back of the boat, and Mr. Orlando was pulling himself up onto the dock at that time. Did you realize at that point whether or not he had been injured? I went directly over the dock and I asked him, I said, are you okay? Let's call the EMTs. She was I, not considerate at all, oh, Your Honor. Your no, honor. she wasn't. You were well, so what you, what you, you did not Talk to me, Lady. Talk to me. She doesn't understand how traumatic this was. I had to stay on, on this boat and watch my husband almost drown. He was under the water. She did not stop immediately. She was still up there doing her captain thing or whatever. I don't really think she's a captain anyway. But anyhow, she stayed there and I had to watch my husband. I couldn't get to him. He had to pull himself up. You must have been pretty helpless. Yes, I mean, I was scared. This is the love of my life. Everything flashed before my eyes. Oh, like, please. she doesn't understand. He pulled himself up on the dock and I asked him, you know, are you okay? And he said he was fine and he got my husband could have died. died on the Do you care about scooter. that at all? That my husband could have died? That's true. Talk he to me negligent. He Talk could to have. Me. He could have been killed. Miss Martin, how's this kind of thing happen? I don't know. To be honest with you, I start out my um, my cruises every time with the same the same scenario. I always tell them, welcome aboard. I tell them that I hope they remember their sunscreen, their hats, their Dramamine, that they did not drink too much the night before. I also tell them I have a few safety rules. The rules are keep your limbs inside the boat. Whenever the boat is in motion, you must remain seated. The only time that um, you can get up is when the boat is tied to the dock. Mr. Orlando, Mrs. Orlando, if Miss Martin goes through this routine every time, do you all remember this happening when you I embarked on this boat? I don't recall hearing any of this information being No safety relayed. rules? You didn't hear any we of We had the safety meeting, but it was more like a safety briefing. It, it lasted no more than five minutes. So the main safety rule, though, that you point out... is to remain seated while the boat is in motion. Now, y'all understood that, like though, right? Up. I didn't hear that at all. Yeah, well, did, thing... did common sense kick in that the maybe you sit down while the boat's she, moving? The only thing that you your Honor. This is your boat. You put it in the slip. These folks are in your care. Bad injuries. Why wouldn't this be your fault? Because he was reckless, Your Honor. Reckless. The boat was not tied up. The gangplank had not been reckless. lowered for him to get off the boat. We had not given them disembarking instructions, and they signed a waiver. Stating so, uh, that you all remember you signing a waiver? I don't remember signing a waiver at all, Your Honor. All right, Have Sheriff right Matt, here. will you get the waiver? Let's look at it. Please do. Your Honor. Let me look at it first. All right, the, it says boat travel waiver. I see it says Nicole Orlando and Mark Orlando. And uh, both of y'all signed it, right? I didn't sign it. I didn't sign it at all. I wasn't even aware of a boat travel. Well, how'd your there. signature get on here? Yeah, no, that's not my signature. That's not your signature? That is not my signature. How did Mark Orlando and somebody's signature get on here? Well, my wife signs for me very often. I mean, I'm, I don't know if you're married, but I'm pretty sure you know that when wow. you become married, you're one. Well, wow. you know, that, that's an interesting legal point. Okay. Under the law, your wife can, under certain circumstances, sign for you. It's called a parent agency right. or a parent authority. Because of your marital relationship, people looking at her, knowing she's your wife, they can assume safely and lawfully that she will sign on your behalf. Right. You all are asking this court to give you $300,000 for pain and suffering. That's a lot of money. Tell me about the pain and suffering. Um, he was able to run marathons. He was able to continue his uh, personal fitness uh, program. Now he's not able to do that. Um, as far as us being able to provide for our family, we can't do that anymore. You're asking this court to award you $75,000 for your past medicals and $20,000 for future medicals. Right. Tell me about your injuries. Three broken ribs, cuts and abrasions. I've received uh, uh, actual collapsed lung on my left side. And it's very painful to deal with. It's, it prevents me from doing just about everything. So to further understand the nature of your injuries, this court has consulted Dr. Frieda McCray Fisher. Sheriff Matt, will you get Dr. McCray Fisher? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. 
Doctor, can you explain what a collapsed lung is? In the case of a rib fracture, if it punctures a hole in that lung, you get a collapsed lung. It's like puncturing and deflating a balloon and you get a pneumothorax. The pneumothorax is the fancy medical word for a collapsed lung. For a collapsed lung. Well, how do you treat a pneumothorax? You have to get this air out of the space and inflate the lung. And a needle would be inserted in between the ribs, into the chest wall, and you literally suck the air out of the chest wall. And the lung then inflates? It does after you go ahead and put a chest tube in. The chest tube is attached to a box which has suction. So then you're sucking out the air, the blood sometimes, and different fluid. And you keep this chest tube in until this collapsed lung reinflates into a normal lung. How does a puncture of the lung affect the lung long term? When this space has been violated, you are more likely to get a recurrent collapsed lung. Thank you, doctor. You are released from testimony. We appreciate you. Thank you. You do understand Ms. Martin's side, that you're the one that jumped off her boat. I could completely understand if she had not been reckless herself throughout the entire boat trip. So she was doing reckless things during the, the fishing She thought she was evil Knievel on, on water. That's Absolutely. what she thought she was. Now, y'all do know you're talking about a Navy veteran, right? Yeah, well, she doesn't act like it. I don't trust her nautical at skills all. at all. And I also have evidence of just how negligent the defendant is. And She's what, very what evidence is that? Well, actually, it's a speeding ticket. This so-called captain has had a speeding ticket and careless driving for the boat. Sheriff Matt, will you get the documents from Miss Orlando? So her 22 years of experience, I don't think so. Like I said, y'all, I don't trust. Well, let's look at what you got here. All right, so you've got one document that's boating violation notice. It says Nancy Martin. It's even your boat, Lorelei, uh, July 17th. Careless operation, speeding in restricted zone. They even fined you some pretty stiff fines. Do you remember this, Ms. Martin? Yes, Your Honor. And the circumstances of that day, it was late afternoon. I was taking my family out for a cruise, and there was a boat that was speeding toward us. I don't know if he had been drinking or what, but he did not look like he was going to stop. So, yes, I gunned my engines. Were you wrong? Um, Yes, sir, I was in the wrong. I take full responsibility for that. I paid my fine. They did not restrict my license. It is the only infraction I've ever got in my years in the military or as a civilian. Let me give you a legal lesson. While this is informative to me as to incidents in the past, these past incidents don't necessarily determine someone's fault in the case today. It lets me see what prior habits are. But because you were a bad driver on a day before today doesn't make you a bad driver today. I appreciate you giving this to me, but it's just one piece of the justice puzzle. Folks, I think I have heard enough. I'm ready to render my decision. <laughs> Folks, in every personal injury case, the plaintiff has to prove three things. You, Mr. Orlando, have to prove that Ms. Martin was wrong and that her wrong caused your injuries and other harm that you seek compensation for. Here, you've put up evidence that Ms. Martin was operating the boat crazy out there during the trip, that when you get into the slip, she says, welcome home. You think that means you've stopped and you feel the boat stop. But just as you're about to jump, she slams it in reverse and you jump and hit the pylon, and now you and your family's lives have been changed, and you want this court to hold her accountable. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Martin, you believe that had he simply paid attention during the safety meeting, he would have known he should stay seated until the boat stops and he's given command to exit the boat. Had he followed the safety rules, he wouldn't have gotten hurt. You believe his injuries are because he jumped off too soon took too big of a chance, and this is his fault. Yes. Well, this, uh, this case kind of shines light on two things. One is the importance of safety rules. Mm -hmm. Here, you all signed, whether your wife signed for you or you knew she was signing, you all were given an ample opportunity to know the safety rules. Now, safety rules are important because they inform us as to how we take care of ourselves, which is the second legal principle. 
That is personal safety. The law starts with the person. You have a responsibility to care for yourself, to act reasonably, to not take unreasonable risk. Here the evidence is, even if Miss Martin did put this boat in reverse, you already were unsafe trying to jump. You jumped to your peril and caused your own injuries. The evidence in this case commands me to find against you. And in your favor, Miss Martin, I find for the defendant. That's my final verdict, and this matter is a gun. Mr. Ritchie, it's my understanding from the documents that you file with this court that you sustained injuries at Miss Gray's salon, and you're asking this court to award you medical expenses of $10,000 pain and suffering of $70,000 for a total award of $80,000. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And Ms. Gray, is your position that you provided the service he requested and this is not your fault, true? Yes, Your Honor. Well, let's get into the legal sauce. Mr. Ritchie, what brought you to Ms. Gray's salon this day? Well, Your Honor, as a software engineer, I don't really get the chance to meet a lot of women. I've been doing this for about 10 years and I still don't have a ring or anything like that to show for it. I met this wonderful woman named Debbie and we had been talking for a good long while, we've been texting and it finally came down to the point where she not only wanted to go on a date, but she wanted to go on a trip. She wanted to go to the beach. That's a truth or dare moment. <laughs> I was actually a little bit self-conscious about something that my friend Dave told me. He said that I had to do something about my organic sweater, so to speak, my body hair, your honor. Uh -huh. I, I have a lot of it, and he said, she'll think it's gross, I need to do something about it. So he uh, knew of Miss Gray's establishment, and he set up the appointment for me. So your friend told you you needed a little manscaping to kind of clean up for this date and the beach appearance. Yes, Your Honor. Miss Gray, tell me about your salon. I am the owner of the Elizabeth Gray Salon. We specialize in facial and hair removal. I've been in business for about 10 years. Um, we offer so many choices from laser, which uses a, a beam of light, to electrolysis, which is electricity, to uh, sugar waxing as well, which is we just rip it right off with a strip. Okay. So we offer, we offer a lot of choices. Uh, about 75% of my clients are women. However, in recent years, Your Honor, I've seen a lot of men coming in for some grooming, uh, waxing some obvious places and not so obvious places. Mm -hmm. So guys get more wax than their chest. Exactly. Everyone likes a little grooming and look their best. I really believe, Your Honor, that if I can help not only women, but all people look beautiful, that inside it will help them feel better about themselves. So when someone comes in for hair removal, particularly a man, uh, you take it off where they want it taken off. We do. We make sure that we go over every step with them. So Mr. Ritchie is not really any different from your other male clients who want their chest to be bare. No, he is not. So Mr. Ritchie, what happened? They take me to this back room where there's no windows or anything and get me down to just my boxers and a robe. So the wax lady comes up to me and she asks, what's your pain tolerance? And I figured since my bud Dave could handle it, so could I, so I just said average. They started off with just one patch of skin. And it's one of those things where you just think that it'll get easier as it keeps going. And that just was not the case. They started off by getting this kind of like the stick and rubbing a little bit of the wax on um, one half of my chest. Okay. And then- Now it wasn't hurting yet, right? It was, it was already getting there, but I was just trying to bear through it. Okay. So, she gets out the piece of paper and she presses into my skin. That's when I really felt like something was not right. She rips it off and a piece of my skin with it. And she just kept going over and over again until my skin just looked ravaged. It was bubbling, it was blistering. It did not seem like everything was all right. I asked, I asked her, I asked the wax lady, is this supposed to be normal? And she told me, Quit being a baby. Man up. No. It was a harrowing experience, Your Honor. So this is what that wax did to your skin? Yes, Your Honor, and it's still painful just standing here in this shirt. Is that how this is supposed to work, Miss Gray? That sounds like a torture chamber. No, Your Honor, that is not how it works at my salon. Well, how is this supposed to work? Well, I was 
at the time of this incident, I was in my office doing some filing papers, and one of my estheticians come, came running back to me, and she said she had provided a service to Mr. Ricci. He ran out of the salon without paying. All she cares she about is the money. Tried... When I had to run to the ER Honor, for second-degree she... burns. I'll process it our salon. But isn't this this simple, though, that you put ha hot wax on the skin and you rip the skin off, then it's not supposed to be that way, right? Isn't it that simple? Actually, it's not that simple. Okay. But we offer various choices to remove hair. And we tried to talk with Mr. Ricci. He did not want to hear it. He Your started Honor, waving I was on my lunch break. I was just trying around. to get in and get out. It's supposed to be something in simple. And out. That is not the process of our salon. What we, options did you get? We offer laser. That's when we use a beam of light. We offer electrolysis, using electricity to uh, burn the hair follicle, sugar wax, a substance over the subject where we use a strip to take off the hair in the opposite direction of hair growth. So if he had used these other options, then he wouldn't have had these injuries? Exactly. If he would have listened to what my esthetician was trying to tell him, but instead he would not. Your Honor, it wasn't that I wasn't listening. It was that there were, um, I was getting pulled into the appointment before I even had time to ask any real questions. Uh, you guys said, oh, we have a line. We have to get going, Mr. Ricci. Did they that give you options? No, Your Honor, they did not give me all the options. Because you were not listening, Mr. Ricci. If he doesn't understand the options, then it's pretty natural that he choose what you put in front of him, right? And that's where he is not being forthcoming with the truth. We set him down to make sure he understood his choices. Okay. And we are for many, as I've already stated. He would not listen. We even But look at his chest, Miss Gray. Hot wax, is it supposed to do that? This is unfortunate, but however, we tested a patch of his skin with hot wax. He did not complain at all, Your Honor. He even said, oh, my tolerance level for pain is average. What is your scale, the Spanish Inquisition? And that, and if he does not let someone know about if this hurts or doesn't hurt, how are we supposed to know? No, I didn't know how to come up with the same words. Anytime, anytime we deal with cases, that involve a pain tolerance. It's always dangerous to compare women's pain tolerance versus men. Exactly. We're babies. Y'all have babies. That okay? is right, Your Honor. You've submitted $10,000 in medical expenses to this court. Please explain your injuries. Not only did I experience second degree burns, they ravaged and permanently scarred my chest for the rest of my life. A guy like me doesn't get too many chances with Debbie's. And these, these people, these, this staff at Elizabeth Gray's salon have permanently damaged any chances of ever meeting another Debbie for the rest of my life. This is what her staff did to me, Your Honor. That looks like that hurts right now. It feels like sandpaper every time I try to even move my arm. Ms. Gray, you see, these are real permanent injuries. He did not say anything that he was in any pain. He just kept silent. This is the first time kept I kept silent. I was rolling around on the table, panting, and I asked her, I asked her, was this normal? Was this supposed to be happening? And she told me, man up, quit being a baby. Mr. Ritchie, I'm not as brave as you are. I've never had manscaping. So I've got to understand exactly how this happens from a technical standpoint. This court has consulted an expert esthetician, Ms. Erin Renee. Sheriff, will you get Ms. Renee from the hallway, please? Yes, Your Honor. Tell the truth next time, Mr. Ritchie. Talk to me, folks. Good day, Ms. Renee. Hi. How long have you been working as an esthetician? I've been an esthetician for 14 years. I did bring a model because I wanted to show the process of hair removal with waxing. With the hot wax, all estheticians who perform this service always check the temperature of the wax before they start removing hair. And we check the temperature on ourselves by applying a little bit on the inside of our arm here. And that way, we know exactly what the client is gonna be experiencing. So I'm applying the wax on the direction that the hair actually grows so that you're able to get all of the hair follicles out with one pull. I 
am always honest with my clients and I try to understand their threshold for pain before we get started with the service. In his client intake form, he filled out all of the questions and he said that his pain tolerance was pretty average. And he also said that he's not on any medications that would make his skin hypersensitive to the waxing. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull it. Mm. Yes. So you'll feel it. Now, I'm seeing his reaction. He's got tears in his eyes. <laughs> Mr. Robbins, thank you for coming in here. How did that feel? It hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Renee, he got second degree burns where his skin was ripped out. I won't say that's typical or it's not supposed to necessarily happen. However, there are different things that will impact your results. One, what did he do before the waxing? Mm -hmm. Whether it was laying out by the beach or going to the pool, hanging out, whether it was doing a lot of drinking before he came in to get his service. Mm -hmm. There are different things that can impact the results. Thank you, ma'am. You are released. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Mr. Ritchie, I gotta ask you, were you drinking, taking medications? Did you go to the beach? No, Your Honor. Your Honor. May I present to you a disclosure form? Sheriff, if you'll retrieve the disclosure form. Thank you very much. It reads, Wax Services Client Release Form. Number one, have you ever been treated for skin cancer? You marked no. Correct. Number six, are you exposed to the sun on a daily basis? Or are you considering spending more time in the sun soon? You mark no. Correct. Number seven, do you use a tanning bed? Listen. You mark no, and then there's a signature next to the customer signature indication. Is that your signature, Mr. Ritchie? Your Honor, yes, that might be my signature. So you lied. How do you know he lied? I have a witness who can corroborate my story. And your witness is Miss Alice Roman. That is correct. Miss Roman, would you stand and sure. come to the podium? Absolutely. What did Mr. Ritchie lie about? Well, I was in the waiting room with Mr. Ritchie as he was talking on the phone very loudly. I wasn't trying to be nosy. And I overheard him saying that he was at the tanning bed prior to coming into the salon. You went to the tanning bed, but you said no on the form? I didn't even have time to really read them before they dragged me to the back, eager so to once get to their again, You were not listening and not even reading the questions. Folks, let me give you a legal lesson. Anytime you go into a business and they have you fill out an information packet or an application, it is very, very, very important that you be honest because they have to rely on your representation. Ms. Roman, you, you may be seated. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Gray, so your esthetician put the wax on her arm? The esthetician actually tested his skin, Your Honor. And he did not complain, it did not say anything. Oh, my uh, pain tolerance is average. I think I've heard what I need to hear and I'm ready to render my decision. <laughs> Folks, in every personal injury case, the plaintiff has to prove really three things. You gotta prove that the defendant was wrong, that's number one. Number two is that that wrong caused your injuries. You've put up evidence here today that you totally relied on Elizabeth Gray Salon to take the hair off your chest so you could go on this romantic journey with Debbie. Instead, the esthetician put the hot wax on your chest and ripped your skin off, changed your chest forever, and destroyed your opportunity, potentially for the love of your life. Ms. Gray, you have put up evidence today that your salon gave him several options, but he wasn't listening. He wanted this chest hair gone. He chose the hot wax. Your esthetician actually put it on his skin and asked him, is it too hot? When he didn't complain, she went forward with the procedure and he got burns. Mm -hmm. You've pointed out that he was not quite forthcoming on the application where he indicated that he had not been in a tanning bed. In fact, he had. Here, that collision of the evidence raises two legal principles. One is care for your own safety. You have a responsibility to take care of yourself long before you look to someone else to take care of you. Part of that is being truthful on the application form. 
The other legal principle is professional judgment. Although manscaping and hair removal is common, it is a profession. It's why estheticians have to be licensed. Here, that professional judgment involves not only application of the wax, but whether to do it in light of the circumstances. The expert witness put the wax on her own arm to see if it was hot. The evidence in this case, your esthetician tested the wax on his skin. Your salon is responsible for Mr. Ritchie's injuries because your professional judgment is not relieved based on his misrepresentation. You still must exercise professional judgment in determining whether the wax is too hot or not. It is very simple. It was too hot, should not have been put on, it caused real injury, this is your fault. I find in favor of the plaintiff, and I'm going to award you a total award of $80,000 against Elizabeth Gray Salon. That's my final verdict, and this matter is adjourned.